So, so far we have learned how, of course, the emissions themselves impact on the local concentrations, but also how meteorological conditions can modify the concentrations in urban areas. One important variable determining the high spatial and temporal variability in urban areas is the effect of urban structure or urban topography on the flow and air pollutant concentrations. On the left-hand side figure, you can see an emission coming from a power plant stack. You can see how the flow field carrying the emission is disturbed by a building downwind of the power stack. This is showing how individual buildings are able to modify the flow fields as well as the pollutant concentrations in the vicinity of the building. From the right-hand side, you can see how the orientation of the street canyon will impact on the flow field in an urban area. If the wind is coming perpendicular to a street canyon, so-called street canyon vortices will be formed, and these vortices can transport pollutant emissions taking place at the ground level to higher elevations in the street canyon, and if the street canyon is wide enough, these pollutants can even be dispersed or transported away from the whole street canyon. Alternatively, you can think of the other extreme case where the wind would be coming parallel to the street canyon, and there you can see how the wind would be channeled, and this channeled flow would also very efficiently transport pollutant emissions taking place in the street canyon away from the street canyon. These are a few idealized examples of how the urban form or urban structure can impact the flow fields and furthermore the pollutant concentrations. Here you can see a study where the interest was to understand that what kind of building block layout is most optimal for street level air quality in a boulevard type street canyon. Four different building block scenarios were studied, where either the long side or the short side of the building block was towards the boulevard. With these two scenarios, the building heights were the same, whereas both of the scenarios were also transformed in such a way that in the short side towards the boulevard case, variation in the building height was introduced along the boulevard. And on the case where the long side was directed towards the boulevard, tower type structures on the buildings were introduced. Large city simulation model was used to examine what type of pollutant concentration fields these four building block scenarios would be creating. And these simulated concentration fields you can see on the right hand side. You can see how there is variation or variability in the concentrations both in the boulevard but also on the side streets. It is quite difficult to depict which one of the scenarios is actually best from this figure, but calculating different statistical values over the whole area, it was found out that the most optimal building block layout was the one with short side of the building blocks towards the boulevard in such a way that there would be this larger scale variability in the building heights. This is providing an example of how simply changing the urban topography or urban structure can impact on the air pollutant distributions in an urban area. So, as a summary, urban air quality consists of a wide range of gaseous pollutants as well as aerosol particles. The pollutant concentrations are highly variable both in place and time. This is because the concentrations or the concentrations fields are not simply affected by the emissions taking place from different urban activities, including traffic, industry or energy production, but also the concentrations are impacted by the local meteorological conditions, including wind and atmospheric stability, or by urban form, especially in the case of near-surface emission, 
Whereas in the case of elevated emission, usually the effect of urban form, uh, urban structure is less important as the emissions in any case will not reach as easily the ground level of urban areas.